Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we're delving into the world of the creepy, the cringy, and the crazy. That's right, it's time for another Let's Not Meet video, and my oh my, do we have a long one. Now, depending on whether or not the technological gods look down favorably upon me today, this will either be a single video or a two-part video. If the title to this video says part one, then part two will be posted immediately afterward. This may mean that we have back-to-back -back premieres or something close to it, but I don't think I'm hearing any complaints. <laughs> so, be sure to get comfortable, grab some coffee or tea, and get ready, because it's time to take another journey into the night. So this happened a while back, and I thought I'd share it. Me and my boyfriend at the time were living in this semi-spacious studio apartment that belonged to his dad. We just moved back from England and needed somewhere to stay while we looked for a new place. It was newly renovated, and we had to be out of there pretty quickly because his dad wanted to start renting it out. There was no way we were able to afford the full rent for this place, so we just gave him what we could spare, and I guess his dad wasn't all too hot on the idea of his son and his son's girlfriend, 18 and 21 at the time, living there being as young and stupid as we were together. It was on the third floor, and he recently got a permit to build a roof deck outside. You can walk onto it through the kitchen, and it's kind of level with the neighbor's bedroom window. We were aware that it must have felt a little invasive, so we tried to be considerate about how late we went out on it and regarding the noise and stuff. The tension started to grow between us, when we were outside on a Saturday night, having a smoke, and were just talking at a reasonable volume, when suddenly we hear a harrowing, will you both shut the fuck up and go the fuck back inside? I looked at my boyfriend and just burst out laughing. I looked around to see where it was coming from, and it was old, sweaty hippo of a man peering out of his window, gasping for air as he looked at us as if he was about to kill us. My then boyfriend said, Mate, you could also just ask us normally to keep the noise down, to which he started spewing countless obscenities and barked at us to go back inside. We didn't want his dad to get any complaints about us, so we just went back inside the house. Several days later, we get a phone call from his dad saying the neighbor had called him, saying that we were blasting loud music all weekend, screaming, and had loads of people over. He said he had to call the police. The thing is, even if he had called the police, we would have been none the wiser because we weren't even there. That Sunday morning, we were going out of town for a few days, so it made no sense. Over the course of a few weeks, every time we'd go out to water the plants on the deck or hang up some washing, he would use any excuse to shout abuse at us. It was fucking traumatizing. The pressure in your hose is too high. Your clothes are blocking my sunlight. And some mornings he would eat out on the deck and he would complain that the noise of our cluttery clanking on the plates was bothering him. It was ridiculous. He would constantly tell us how the roof deck shouldn't even be there. So we gave him a copy of the approved permit. Anyway, one afternoon we were kind of getting busy on the couch, nothing too R-rated, but enough to maybe think of getting curtains that weren't as see-through as ours. So we're doing our thing and out of nowhere, my boyfriend looks up and out of the window and his face just drops. He gets up and walks toward the window. What the fuck, he says. I jump out of my skin and ask him what's wrong, but before he would answer me, he leapt outside onto the deck and started banging on our neighbor's window. What just happened, I asked him. He was fucking filming us. I could see a blinking red light through the blinds. 
I was just like, no freaking way. I genuinely didn't believe it at the time and told him it was probably something else, but quite understandably, he wouldn't let it go. He would go out at night and try to look through his window for filming gear. You could only see so far back into his room, so there was no actual certainty that he had any of that stuff. And one day he left his window open, so I guess he wasn't home. Bear in mind this was over the course of several weeks, and he actually climbed halfway through his window, standing on the garden table, and just freaked out. At the end of the room, there was just this wall of videotapes with all these dates and names written on them, and loads of heavy-duty camera equipment at the end of his bed. We called the police and told them we were being stalked. Maybe it was just a coincidence at the time, but I think our suspicions were justified considering his character. He was just an all-out horrible and creepy guy. And if he had footage of me half-naked, <laughs> I wasn't going to take that chance. The police informed us that we didn't have sufficient enough proof that he was filming us, but that they would question him. Without any real evidence, they weren't able to get a warrant to search his house for the tapes. Damn. So, after a while, we decided the only way to do this was to catch him in the act. It was pretty calm between us for a while. After we involved the police, he stopped bothering us, but I still wanted those tapes. One night, we just got back from dinner, and as we're about to go to bed, uh, we hear a knock at the door. It's our other neighbor, who was super cool, asked us about this neighbor we were having issues with. Total understatement. The whole street knew we were on bad terms. Everyone usually kept to themselves, but everyone hated this guy. We told her the whole story, and after talking to her for a while, she offered to call the police and tell them that she also witnessed him filming us. The police came around the next day and informed us that with our neighbor's testimony, they were able to acquire a warrant to search his apartment. A few days later, we watched the entire thing go down. Two police officers showed up to his apartment, gave him a letter, and we just watched the whole thing. An hour or so later, he was arrested, and that was that. We didn't hear anything back from the cops for a while, until we got a call saying that he had been filming us for months. He had footage of us eating, of us napping on the couch, of me getting changed, of my boyfriend working out. It sent shivers down my spine. Not only was I absolutely furious, but really freaked out. We pressed charges, and eventually he got a few months jail time. We eventually moved out, but I never found out what they did with the tapes. I think they're probably in an evidence locker now. But yeah, to the crazy asshole who stalked and terrorized and filmed us for months on end, let's never meet again. This happened in the mid to late 80s. I couldn't have been more than six or seven years old. It was summertime, and my mother and I were at my grandmother's house in St. Albans, Queens for a barbecue. Like most houses in this area, my grandmother's house was fairly close to her neighbors. It's mid-afternoon, and the adults had all been drinking for a few hours and were laughing about things I was too young to understand. I was sitting in the backyard, playing with my Transformer toys, when something in the second floor window of the neighbor's home caught my eye. It was a hand puppet, but at that time the Muppets were so popular that I thought any sort of puppet was a Muppet. Anyway, the puppet began to move and wave at me, and I laughed and asked my mother to look at the window. She and the other adults looked and began to laugh and yelled at the window, you still playing with those dolls, Larry? I only say his name was Larry because I can't for the life of me remember the name they called him. Larry then came into view in the window, and the Muppet was obviously on his right hand. Looking back on it, he was probably in his early 30s or late 20s, considering my mom and uncles knew him. He waved at everyone and walked out of view. Now, at that age, I thought any adult that played with toys or video games was really cool, but I had never seen one who had a Muppet. 
I figured he was a ventriloquist, and I was really excited at the idea of him coming outside with the puppet and doing a show for us. The barbecue went on, and I kept glancing at the window, hoping to get another look at the puppet, but I guess Larry had put on enough of a show for one day. The barbecue proceeded as usual, and by the evening, people were beginning to leave while others went to get more alcohol. My mother told me that we were staying at my grandma's tonight because she didn't want to drive home. I began to feel tired, so I went down to the basement to get in the pull-out bed I slept in when we stayed overnight. The basement had several rectangular-shaped windows that were placed right below the basement ceiling. My cousins and I liked to look out these windows because we had to climb on furniture to get to them, and because the windows were so low to the ground on the outside that we could spy on what was happening around the house without being detected. I turned off all the lights in the basement and climbed into bed. The adults all seemed to be upstairs in the kitchen and living room, and once I heard music playing, I knew it would be one of those nights. I was in bed and nearly asleep when, in my peripheral vision, I detected something outside the basement window across from me, peering down at me. Once my eyes adjusted a bit, I could make out the white and bulbous shaped eyes right above an unnatural wide smile. I was petrified, but after a few seconds, I realized that this was the Muppet from earlier in the day. This didn't exactly give me any sense of relief because now I'm trying to determine how the hell the Muppet from the neighbor's house got outside and was looking into my grandma's window. My uncles were at the barbecue and they took delight in running these kinds of jokes on me, so I figured one of them got the Muppet from Larry and was trying to scare the crap out of me. And just as I was about to go upstairs to get my mom, the damned thing tapped on the window. The same smile and unblinking eyes staring at me, but now its three-fingered cartoonish hand was tapping the window, resulting in a muffled sort of thud 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 sound. I'll admit, when I initially saw this thing staring down at me, I was too scared to move, but once it started tapping the glass, my instinct to scream for my mother kicked in. I opened my mouth, and just as I was about to scream with everything I had, Larry came into view out of the corner of the window. He must have been laying down on the driveway with, pu with a puppet on his hand. He put a finger to his lips, indicating for me to be quiet, and gestured for me to come outside with his left hand. This was so goddamn freaky that any notion of Larry being a cool guy with a Muppet was out the window. I got out of bed and was walking upstairs to find my mom or grandmother, whoever was less intoxicated. I looked back at the window prior to ascending the stairs, and both the puppet and Larry were still staring at me. The frozen smile on the puppet and the eerie look of excitement on Larry's face still unnerves me to this day. I ran upstairs and found my mother going through records looking for something to play. When my mother was drinking, she could be in any number of moods. I didn't know whether she'd be annoyed at me or make me dance with her to whatever song was playing. Thankfully, she wasn't quite drunk yet and heard what I had to say. After I finished telling her what had happened, she told me to stay in the living room while she took a look outside. She got one of my uncles to go with her, and they both left out the back door. Several minutes passed, and neither one came back inside. I went to the door and heard my mother and uncle talking. I cracked the door open and saw that they were smoking cigarettes. I said, Mom? in that way only a little kid can when he or she wants something but is afraid to annoy their parents. Baby, she very shortly responded, there's no one out here, you must have imagined it. I asked if I could sleep upstairs in my aunt's room and my mother said that I could. As I closed the door, I heard my uncle ask if I had had a bad dream. 
and my mom responded that I always want attention when she's with people. And that was my cue that she was annoyed and I had best not bother her any more that night. I went upstairs to my aunt's room, which was actually a large closet that had been converted to a very small bedroom, and got under the covers, praying that Larry didn't come and get me. Thankfully, there were no windows in her room. The years passed, and every time I was at Grandma's, I'd glance at the neighbor's window for any sign of that puppet. About a decade later, I was at my grandmother's house helping her do chores when I asked her about the guy next door with the puppet. Who? She responded. You don't remember the guy next door that had the puppet in the window that one day? She thought for a while before saying, Oh, yeah, Larry? He hasn't been here in a long time. He got in big trouble for doing something to his younger cousin and moved down south. Wow. I was suddenly that scared little boy, lying in bed in my grandmother's basement, staring at two sets of eyes, staring back at me, wondering what the hell would have happened had I gone outside. Thankfully, I'll never know. I had had an interview in the city center and had met up with a couple girlfriends afterwards. I was dressed quite nicely. White blouse, black cardigan, black trousers, not jeans, and some cute kitten heels. It had been raining, and so I was a quite damp and blech, you can fill in the blanks. It looked like the results of a wet t-shirt contest, or a car wash gone horribly wrong. My friends had to go home, so I hopped on the bus that stopped essentially right outside my house. It wasn't late, maybe like 4 p.m., and in summer, so it was still light out and had stopped raining by now. I sat at the back of the bus, where you usually have nine seats, four face backward and five face forward, so that the heat from the engine of the shitty old bus could warm me up a little. This guy, Frank, was already sat there, but he was tucked away in a corner and I had headphones in, so I assumed he wouldn't talk to me and was harmless. I was incorrect. As soon as the bus took off, Frank shuffled over next to me and said something. I took an earbud out and asked him what he had said, and he basically just said, Hey, how's it going? What have you done today, missy? I replied politely and started putting my earbud back in, but he started talking again. This time, he introduced himself and reached out to shake my hand. I gave him a fake name, thank you parents for teaching me about quick thinking and hammering it into my skull, and shook his hand. He would not let go, for like a solid minute, and he was staring at my cleavage before I even said my name. I pulled my hand away and he put his on my thigh. Now, this is where I should have gotten the bus driver involved, or at least moved seats. Guess what? I did neither of those things. We talked for about five minutes more. I think the fact that he actually touched me sort of sent me into a minor shock, and I just froze. He started asking me personal questions, after asking how my interview had gone, such as who I lived with. Would anybody be home when I got home? I lied and told him that my butch's shit girlfriend would be waiting for me as she'd cooked dinner for me. I was hella single, but he didn't need to know that. As all creepy old men on buses do, he started asking about our relationship. How long had we been together? Would we get married? Did we want kids? Would we need a donor? Your usual shit, really. While he was asking all this crap, a young guy, Sam, who was maybe my age at the time had gotten on the bus, made eye contact with me and sort of half smiled, and then went to the top deck. So after, Frank asked the somehow line-crossing question of, will your girlfriend be waiting for you in the shower? I stood up, told him that I had recognized a friend, and went upstairs. 
practically ran up the stairs to the top deck where I explained everything to Sam. He let me sit by him in case Frank came upstairs after me. The question was line-crossing for me, I think, because of the way he stared at me when he said it. I vividly remember him licking his lips and clearing his throat and everything. It was vile. I got home about five minutes after going upstairs. Frank was thankfully no longer on the bus. When I got into the house, nobody was home. My parents and sister were all out elsewhere, and I tried calling them all, but nobody answered, so I cried and shook and threw up, alone, for almost two hours. I was a shaky mess even when they got home and had nightmares for weeks and saw him everywhere I went, although when I'd check, he definitely wasn't there. I never saw him again, and I wrote in a report to the bus company, I think, telling them the day and rough time I was on the bus, where I was sat, and roughly what he and I looked like. I honestly just got the creeps, even writing about it now, but creepy piece of shit on the bus, who frankly ruined my day after having an amazing interview, let's not meet ever, ever again. This happened a few years ago when I was 15 years old. I would always go jogging around my block in the summer. My jogging route was shaped like a rectangle. My usual jogs took place around 6 or 7 at night, so kind of later in the day, but it was still bright enough to go out. I always figured that it was pretty much safe to go out as long as the sun was up. It was a particularly hot summer day, so I wore a somewhat tight t-shirt and tight athletic shorts. I was a bit of a late bloomer when it came to puberty, so at the time, I didn't feel the need to feel cautious about the way I dressed. I was running for a few minutes while listening to music when I started hearing the strange whirring sound behind me. At first I ignored it and kept going, but then I realized that I'd been hearing this sound for the past two minutes, so I turned around. To my surprise, some guy much older than me was riding his bicycle right at my heels. I stopped running, obviously very startled. I turned to look at the guy and warily asked him if he needed something. He says, nothing, I just wanted to talk to you. I frowned and asked him what he wanted to talk to me about. He gave me a creepy smile and said, Has anyone told you you're really beautiful? I hesitantly thanked him. He looked me up and down several times and gave me a creepy smile and added, And you're sexy too. Okay, weird. I properly examined him. He was in his early 20s and tall. I immediately got creepy vibes from this guy because he would not stop looking me up and down. He asked me how old I am. In my panic, I don't think straight, and stupidly I told him, and his smile disturbingly lit up. He asked if I wanted to be his girlfriend, and I said no right away. He made an angry face and asked me why not, but I ignored him and started to head in the direction of home. But much to my dismay, he kept following me. While he was following me, he motioned to a secluded area of the neighborhood and said, why don't you go over there with me? I told him no and that I really needed to get home. I must have looked as scared as I felt because he gave me a horrible smile and said, you scared? My heart pounded in fear, but I ignored him and kept walking. I desperately looked around, hoping to see somebody that I knew in their front yard, but the neighborhood seemed eerily vacant. He continued to follow me and kept trying to lure me to that secluded area and kept telling me how sexy I am. I was about to reach the corner that turned down the street of my house but inwardly, I was freaking out. I didn't know what to do. The last thing I wanted was for this creep to know where I live. However, 
To my relief, I see an elderly couple, whom I have conversed with several times while walking my dog, come out of their house. I quickly waved at them, and thankfully they saw me. I crossed the street and began to head in their direction, and I looked up and saw the guy looking really pissed off. He looked me up and down one last time before saying, It was nice meeting you, sexy, before biking off. I look to see where he was going, and he goes off somewhat ahead of my street and goes into the row of houses ahead of mine. I ran back home when I was sure he wasn't around anymore, and I told my parents what happened. They were concerned, but told me just to be careful and not to run in the evening anymore. I really hoped that would be the last time I saw him, but unfortunately, I wasn't that lucky. I didn't encounter him for another couple of weeks. And during the afternoon, I was walking home from a friend's house and was taking the path near the forest, which was right by a man-made pond. The pond was surrounded by several bushes and prairie grass. I took in my surroundings, and to my horror, I saw a familiar person on a bike about to turn into the path I was in. Without thinking, I darted behind some bushes and laid on my stomach. I was able to see through a small crevice in the bush. I must not have been quick enough because he started to ride his bike back and forth among the cluster of bushes I was hiding in. Then he suddenly stopped. I knew he didn't leave because I would have seen him. I felt a tremor of fear because he was obviously waiting for me to come out. After what felt like half an hour, I couldn't take it anymore. I was so close to my house. I dialed my dad's number on my phone and said in a loud voice exactly where I was and I sped walked in the direction of my house. I met his eyes as quickly as I could and passed him, my heart hammering in my chest from the horribly perverted look he gave me. Thankfully, he rode off after I passed him and I waited till he was far away enough to go into my house. A week later, I was running in late afternoon. I had become a lot more alert ever since the first incident occurred. I know I'm stupid and I should have changed my jogging route, but I was running past the place where I managed to get away the first time the corner into the row of houses that leads to mine, and while I was walking I got distracted by the sudden movement in my peripheral. I saw the shape of a familiar guy sitting on a truck. Before I could even process what to do, the guy sitting there suddenly looked up and saw me. To my utter horror, he quickly leapt up and picked up his bike. I immediately knew it was him and I bolted down the street to my house. The problem with doing that was that he now knew where I lived. My brothers and dog were outside and they saw me running. They asked me what was wrong, but I ignored them and slammed the door. I peeked out of my blinds and saw him start to slow down as he pedaled past my house. To my absolute fury, he petted my dog without even asking. He then sat on the bench near my house and was just watching it. I was absolutely livid at this point. I was sick of constantly having to be afraid when I went outside. I went to my parents and said that I found out where the creep lived. My dad insisted on going to the guy's house for some reason. He brought my brother and a family friend just in case. I came along to make sure they went to the right place. We knocked on his door and an older man and woman, who I assumed was his father and mother, answered. The man asked if everything was okay, and before my father could reply, I angrily butted in and asked him if he had any sons. He replied yes, that he had two. At that moment, a little boy, no older than five, emerged. I asked him how old his sons were. The little boy answered before his father could. Five and twenty-three. My father explained what happened, and the older man's face changed. He yelled something in rapid Spanish, and a few seconds later the creep emerged. I couldn't help the satisfaction that surged within me when I saw that he knew he was probably busted. 
His father said something in Spanish, and he looked at us and said, where's your proof? My dad wasn't having any of that bullshit. He threatened to call the police if he didn't stop harassing and stalking me. All he did was scoff as he went back upstairs. His parents apologized on his behalf and begged us not to call the police because they had recently emigrated to the US. My dad decided not to take action as long as the creep would leave me alone. What's strange is that the creep ended up coming to my house to apologize and ask that we not call the police and that he promised he would stop. I reluctantly decided not to, and he did stop, but sometimes I wonder if I made the right decision. This happened when I was around 10. I live in a relatively small county, and it only took a couple hours drive to get from my house to my aunt's house, which was in another county. This story starts off with me and my mom driving home from my aunt's. We were driving on a country road when this battered looking minivan started driving in front of us at a roundabout. We were the only two cars on the road. There were gardening tools and a tarp in the back window. It was clear immediately that the driver was either drunk, high, or a fucking idiot. They were repeatedly swerving out of their lane like they were a video game protagonist. It was a hot day, so both of our cars had the windows down so we could hear what sounded like a sermon blasting from their radio. We drove behind them for roughly seven minutes with my mom muttering about the state of the country. The minivan abruptly stopped in the middle of the road, which roughly pissed off my mom. The driver did an illegal U-turn, during which two things happened. I saw the driver's face. He was a skinny, middle-aged man with dirty yellow hair and a beard, and we both got a look at each other's license plates. The driver turned into the opposite lane and drove past us, heading back into town, still driving erratically and almost hitting us. After he was gone, my mom pulled over and called the police to report him, giving them his license plate and a description of his appearance. The cop thanked us and promised to get right on it. When we were nearly home, my mom got a call from the guards, where they told her they had arrested the guy who had warrants for drug dealing and domestic abuse. My mom was thanked and we all joked about her being a hero over pizza that night. Cut to a few weeks later when school had started up again. I had gone with my dad to the hardware store. While my dad was at the checkout, I was looking out at the parking lot and that's when I saw the battered minivan driving out of the lot. I didn't see the driver, so I convinced myself that it was only a coincidence, although my dad noticed I seemed uneasy for the rest of the night. A few days later, my mom came home early from work, looking like she had just run a marathon. She gave me and my brothers tight hugs, and we were sent to bed earlier than usual that night. I didn't learn about this next part until last year. The reason my mom was acting so weird is because her secretary had reported seeing a strange man inspecting the license plates of my mom's car. My mom asked what the man looked like, and froze when she was given the description of the guy we had reported. That weekend, my mom didn't want any of us kids leaving the house, but I was a stubborn little shit and all but demanded to be allowed out for a quick walk around the neighborhood. While I was out and roughly 15 minutes walk away from my house, a vehicle drove past me. It was the minivan, and the same man was in the driver's seat, giving me a friendly nod. As soon as he was out of sight, I ran back home and told my parents, who immediately bundled us all into my dad's car and drove to stay the night at my grandma's. I was put in the guest room, but I had zero chance of falling asleep, so I was wide awake for all the drama that happened that night. My parents called the cops and informed them about the man stalking us. A couple hours later, a squad car pulled up outside and the officers told my parents everything. When they arrived to our house, the one we had just left, they had discovered the front door had been forced open. Some of our nicest possessions had been smashed and were left in shards on the floor, but that's not even the worst part. No, 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 no. The worst part was when the police found the man. 
in the pantry, holding what a female officer described as the biggest damn knife I've ever seen. We spent the next few days at my grandma's while my parents handled all the legal business. The man was sentenced to life in a psychiatric hospital and none of us have seen him since. I dread to think what would have happened if I hadn't gone for a walk that day. This is one of those stories where you just don't even know where to begin. So let's start with when I first met Bryson. As teens, my friends and I went to a lot of shows. I'd say most of the people I know today are people I met at some hardcore show at some dirty venue. Being a 110 pound girl at the edge of a pit with too many beers in her, I sometimes got bumped into it, but it didn't bother me too much. So one night, this absolute beast of a man comes and stands in front of me and fends off all the drunk punks and makes sure that no one else bumps into me or my best friend Joyce. How sweet of him. So the months turn into years and we all grow up a bit and start going to less and less shows. I was at my tattoo artist when I bump into Bryson in the waiting section. We catch up a bit and I find out that he works close to where I live. So we have a massive chat. He asks about Joyce. He asks if we're still inseparable and if she still works at the same place. He's super sincere and kind and he's well known in our scene. So when he asked for my number, I didn't have a single issue giving it to him. After that, we were texting often, but not often enough to make it a thing. The band Every Time I Die was on tour in my country a few weeks later, and it was during the rainy season of the year. And Joyce and I obviously had the time of our lives. And Bryson was there, and we had shots with him. Now, if I'm going to tell you the story of how I lost one of my shoes in the mud, I'd be lying, because I honestly have no idea how it happened. I just woke up minus one sneaker and didn't think too much of it. They were old anyways. And this is where things start getting weird. I'm at my part-time job when one of the guys from the van store rocks up to my shop. He's got two pair of vans in my size and says I can pick one. I tried to explain to him that I don't have money for shoes right now, but he says, don't worry, the guy with the tattoos paid for them already. You can have either one of these pair. The guy with the tattoos? <laughs> that didn't exactly narrow it down. The only tattooed guy I could think of that would buy me new sneakers was probably my ex, but he lives in a different country now, so it's virtually impossible. I asked the band's employee if he had a name for me, but he said no. So I picked a pair and decided I'd try to figure out who got them for me when I was on my break. Just as I'm about to finish work, Bryson meets me at my shop. The guy with the tattoos. I ask him and he says yes, it was him that bought the shoes. I said thanks and I offered to repay him, but he says he would just like to take me out for dinner. I politely declined, so he offered to give me a ride home. Weeks and months pass, a random text from Bryson here and there, but nothing much. I got a boyfriend, we broke up a year later, I moved out of town and I moved back again. By now, I am an adulting woman. I run into Bryson at a show and we have a catch up. He seems happy, he's doing well in life. He asks if I still have the same number. He asks about Joyce, asks if we're still inseparable. The same questions as before. I say yes to all of them. Now at this stage, I am working at a shop in a strip mall. As per what I guess became a little tradition, a package from Vans arrived at my shop. They're addressed to me, my size, not really my style. I message Bryson and he says it's a gift and that he'd still like that dinner. Again, I offered to repay him and kindly declined the dinner date. A week or so passes and he arrives at my shop with two bags full of lush goodies and lunch for myself and my colleague. He says he's been in the area and he felt like doing something nice for me. I felt overwhelmed and said that there's no way I could accept all of this. For anybody who doesn't know, Lush bath products are really expensive. He insists. He says how the sales lady at Lush said that she wishes she had a guy to buy her such nice stuff. 
I offered to repay him. Still, just dinner. I say to him that I don't want to do that because I feel like I'd be wasting his time and leading him on. He said that he would never think that I was bullshitting him because he loves me. Loves me. Um, okay, that escalated quickly. I was without words. When he left, I sent him a text asking him to please not buy me gifts anymore. He didn't reply. Fast forward about a month. I am having a housewarming slash Halloween party at my apartment. I am dressed as Mia Wallace and Joyce is Beetlejuice and we're busy getting ready. I already have a dozen of my friends downstairs having fun and being social. Suddenly, another friend of mine hammers on my bedroom door, freaked the hell out. There's a guy with a gun downstairs asking for you. What? A guy with a gun? One of my guests? As I'm trying to figure out what's going on, my housemate bolts upstairs, pushes me into my room, and closes me inside. Dude, Bryson is here, and he's got a gun. Joyce is hyperventilating by this time. She said, I gave him your address. He said you invited him to your party, but you never sent him the link to your place. I'm so sorry. Oh my god, I didn't know. I'm freaking out and screaming at my friends. Just call the fucking police. Just call the police. Eventually, my friend managed to talk him into putting his gun away, saying that if he doesn't, we'll call the police and he doesn't want Bryson to get in trouble. I watched my friend lead Bryson outside back to his car. My last memory of Bryson is him crying loudly, pacing up and down in front of my apartment block, repeatedly hitting himself on the head with his gun. I've blocked him from any way of possibly contacting me, and I haven't bumped into him since. I'm not sure if he's even in town anymore. Apparently he found a job about three hours away from here. I ended up moving somewhere else, but I still work at the same place. I hope he's figured out that you can't buy someone's affection, nor can you scare it into them. Please, Bryson, let's never meet again. This happened to me a couple of years ago. At the time, my fiancé didn't believe me, but I'd been convinced for several weeks that someone was watching our house. Several Amazon packages had been stolen. There were cigarette butts by the front door, but neither of us smoke, and our doormat had been moved. We had just moved to the area recently, and I was really uneasy about all of this. My fiancé teased me for watching too many murder mysteries and crime shows, and I eventually dropped the subject, not wanting to be berated. One night, we're in bed together, nearly asleep. Our cats started being really loud, so my fiancé gets up to feed her, and realizes we forgot cat food when we were out earlier. We both feel really guilty about going to sleep knowing that she's hungry, so he tells me not to worry. He says he'll just run over to the little 24-hour convenience store that's maybe five minutes down the street. He gets dressed to leave, and I roll over to go back to sleep. I'm laying on my side in bed, facing our window, and as he leaves, I can see his shadow on the blinds as he walks down the street. Now, I didn't know it yet, but he forgot to lock the door. Maybe a minute or two after he leaves, I see his shadow pass by the bedroom window again and hear footsteps coming back up the sidewalk. I figure since he was tired, he probably forgot his wallet and had to come back. This has happened before. I chuckled to myself at how forgetful he is, and the front door opens. My cat jumps off the bed to go and greet him. What happened next took place over the span of maybe three minutes, but it felt like three days. It was dark and dead quiet in our house. Quiet enough that I could hear my cat's little steps on the bedroom carpet suddenly stop. She then lets out the deepest, most terrifying growl I have ever heard a cat make. At this point, I hear a person take a few steps into our living room, shush her, and sneeze. It is definitely not my fiancé. I'm a woman, alone, at night, naked in bed, scared out of my mind, and I have no idea what to do. 
This guy clearly knows my fiance is out. Does he know I'm home alone? Is he here to kidnap me or hurt me? A million thoughts raced through my head. My phone had died earlier, of course, so it's off and plugged into the charger. And I know once I turn it on, AT&T's loud as fuck little jingle is going to betray me, so for right now, I'm on my own. Thankfully, we keep a shotgun by our bed. So I slipped out of bed, grabbed my gun, and crawled as quietly as I could toward the bedroom door, which was about two thirds of the way closed. I can hear the creep rummaging through our stuff in the living room, and he sneezes again. This dick. I peek through the gap in the door, and the outside light is just barely bright enough to illuminate a man hunched over our entertainment center, his back to me. I silently open the door the rest of the way and stand up, still 100% naked and 100% determined to keep myself and my cat safe. I muster all my stupidity and courage and cock the shotgun, and in the deepest, booming voice my body will allow me to physically make, I bellow out, what the fuck do you think you're doing? I have never seen a human jump so hard or run so fast in all my life. I scared that creep so badly he about launched himself into orbit. I got one good look at his back as he ran outside into the darkness and then he was gone. I slammed the door shut behind him and yanked my terrified cat out from under the couch by the neck. We booked it to the bedroom with my gun and I held her so close to my chest, just sobbing while I struggled to turn my phone on and dial 911. My fiance got home with a can of cat food moments later and immediately noticed the PS4 on the ground and our other electronics moved around. He found me in the bedroom flipping out and I barely got any words out to explain what had happened before the cops showed up. They were super nice, but unfortunately there wasn't much they could do. They didn't have a lot to go on as I hadn't seen the man's face and couldn't really give them a solid description. Fortunately, none of our stuff actually ended up being taken, and more importantly, my cat and I were both okay. However, we were positive the creep lived in our area, as a few weeks later, someone we knew up the street was robbed in the exact same way. He left his door unlocked for a moment to run to the store, came back, and all his electronics had been stolen. I'm not sure if they ever caught this creeper, but we noped out of that neighborhood pretty quick. Lock your doors, people. And a creepy thief watching my house? Let's never meet again. This happened a while back when I was 12 or 13. It was summer, really hot outside, and everyone was wearing dresses, shorts, tank tops, sandals, that kind of thing. Where I'm from, it's normal for kids to take public transportation to and from school as opposed to being driven or taking the school bus, which isn't even a thing here. As it was so hot, I wore a tank top and a wrap skirt that I borrowed from my mom. I was a teen, but still young enough where you think your parents are cool and not weird. And I really liked this one of my mom's. It was green and it was long, definitely nothing seductive about it. And if you can picture the words 12 to 13 year old and seductive in one sentence without cringing, you're a creep. Anyway, I was heading back from school, which always ended at 3 p.m. And I just got off the bus with about five to 10 minutes of walking home in the residential area left to go. It couldn't have been much later than say 3.30, so broad daylight, and a bunch of people were milling around, getting home from work, going to do their groceries, that sort of thing. As I'm about to cross the road from the bus stop to go home, a car stops for me. It's a very typical make for this part of the world, a nondescript kind of beige color. Not too new, not too old. There's a dude driving the car and no one else in it. He greets me with familiarity. Hi, how are you? Now, I've been brought up to be polite, so I answer, I'm okay, thank you. He's still in the car, behind the driving wheel, engine running. You look really nice today. 
Thank you, I say. You don't remember me, do you? I'm a friend of your dad's, from work. I'm just driving down to have some coffee at your place. Hop in, I'll give you a ride home. Now, I've been raised well, and I don't want to be rude, but I've also been raised to apply critical thinking and to listen to my instincts. Thank you for the offer, but I'm fine. I can walk. The guy is sort of nondescript, too, maybe in his late 30s, early 40s, about my dad's age. Brown hair, normal clothes. He absolutely could have been my dad's friend. My dad's quite social, and there are a lot of couples and colleagues he knows that he hangs out with. There are a lot of people that know me and my siblings that I've never met since I was small. I've always had a really bad memory for faces anyway, and I think to myself, maybe I do know him. But the red flag at the back of my mind is waving frantically, and I'd rather be rude than dead. Oh, but it's no hassle for me, he says. I'm going your way anyway. Just hop in. We'll be there in a flash. In my 12 to 13 year old brain, two parts of me are arguing. I don't want to be impolite and maybe cause difficulties for my dad. After all, by car, it's maybe just a minute or two, and that's not time enough to get too awkward, right? I don't want to insult someone I do know, just can't remember by not recognizing him. On the other hand, I can't place his face. I can't remember his name. He doesn't look familiar, and I was taught about stranger danger. I also have a hefty amount of my own aloofness and self-preservation to go along with it. Even at 12 or 13, when I listened to my gut, I often felt rude afterward, but that was the extent of the trauma. And when I talked myself out of it with reason, I often discovered later that my senses are quite astute at picking up things I'm unable to process until later, and I'm often very correct. So I muster my courage, knowing I'll probably be embarrassed later because I didn't know my dad's good friend, and say, I'm so sorry, sir. I don't mean to be rude, but I don't recognize you. Once I get home, if you're having coffee with my dad, I'll apologize. But I really would feel better just walking home. The dude says nothing. His expression goes cold. Have I really offended him? And then he quickly rolls up his window and drives off, totally not in the direction of where my dad lives. That alerted my red flag to military parade in Turkey levels of activity, but also flooded me with relief that I decided not to be polite. It was only once he was out of view that I thought I should have tried to read and remember his license plate. I decided to take a very much a roundabout way to get home, just in case. While walking, I talked myself into believing that I'm just paranoid and that it was completely unnecessary. I get home, and of course, there is no visitor there. I was a distracted kid and very well able to gaslight myself on my own, so... By the time I got there, I decided the whole exchange was unimportant and almost forgot about it in a couple of weeks. It's not until years later that it suddenly dawned on me that I absolutely should have told my parents, and I probably should have reported it. That was not normal behavior, and it was potentially dangerous. I got out alright, because I've always been a kid with a healthy amount of self-preservation, but God knows, maybe he tried it again with the more naive kid. I try to play safe myself, thinking maybe it was his first ever attempt and maybe my paranoia persuaded him that it was too big of a risk. Not likely, but possible. God only knows what would have happened to me if I had gotten into that car. He was not somebody that I know, but at the same time, he wasn't trying to hide his face at all, which might mean all sorts of things, from really just being socially awkward and trying to be helpful, all the way to you won't be in a position to tell anyone ever again anyway, so who cares? The scariest thing of all is that this isn't something that happens in the dark, in secluded, nasty places. It was full daylight, and people were around. Though no one was in direct hearing range, it wouldn't have looked strange to anyone at all as long as the exchange hadn't taken too long and there was no violence involved. So, creepy dude who tried to kidnap me, let's not meet again. 
So this happened to me about three years ago, but I'll start with a bit of context. I was chosen to go on an exchange trip to Estonia as part of my music course at college. During the trip, everyone was to be allocated into bands. In these bands, we would write music together and get the opportunity to record our songs at a high-class music studio. Anyway, the day of the recording session had come. I was the bassist for the last band that got to record that day, so I spent most of the day at the hotel where all the international students stayed. I shared my room with two other students who came from my college, and they both had early recording sessions booked. By the time I was packing my equipment to leave for the studio, most of the students had started coming back. The studio was only a short walk away, so I got directions from one of the students and made my way there. After about three hours at the studio, I started to make my way back to the hotel. As I rounded the corner onto the hotel street, I took my phone out and looked up a good album to listen to when I got back to my room. I had my head down at my phone, music blasting from my headphones, and I wasn't really paying any attention. As I entered the hotel, I took my headphones out and made my way to my room. I noticed that it was really quiet. And this was strange, especially as the hotel was right in the middle of the city. I got to my room and tried to open my door, but it was locked. I was told that my roommates would be back by this time, and they had said they'd leave the door open for me, so I was really confused. I looked everywhere for my keys, but I had left them in the room. So I got out my phone and began to text one of my roommates. The conversation went something like this. Me. Hey, I'm back at the hotel, but the door's locked. I thought you said you'd be in. Roommate. You're in the hotel? Me. Yeah, but I don't have my keys. When are you going to be back? Roommate. Dude, you have to get out of there now. Me. What? Why? Roommate. Just get out. At this point, I started receiving messages from other students telling me, get out of there. It's not safe. You have to get out of the hotel. I was really confused, and for a minute I thought it was just a big joke. But then I got one of the most terrifying phone calls of my life. One of the lecturers at the college who came along on the exchange phoned me. He told me that the hotel had been evacuated because there's a guy staying on the other side of the hotel that was running around with a handmade knife trying to attack students. The whole hotel was empty, apart from me and this crazy person. At that point, reality hit hard. I was trapped on the top floor. I couldn't even lock myself in my room. I had to make my way back down and out quickly. I hung up and I started to move. The hotel had no elevator, so I slowly made my way around, listening for any sounds, peeking my head around corners to make sure it was safe. My adrenaline was high. Every creak of the floor made my teeth grit. Um, by the time I made it to the stairs, I felt sick with fear. I stopped caring about making noise and just started running down the stairs. I just wanted to get out of there. I felt like it was taking hours to clear a single flight. Eventually, I got to the first floor and I could see the reception area. Freedom from this nightmare was so close. However, as I made my way down, somebody walked around the corner and stopped at the bottom of the stairs. I noticed the figure and stopped dead in my tracks. A middle-aged man with short dark hair, topless, covered in what looked like oil and grease, holding in his hand a filthy rag covering something underneath it. As he turned his hand slowly, I saw the handle. It was a knife. It was too late to hide. We locked eyes and my blood ran ice cold. I wanted to run, but fear glued me in place. A thousand scenarios ran through my head at once. What if he charges at me? What if he gets to me? What should I do? We just keep staring at each other. Someone's got to make the first move in this situation, and it's got to be me. I have to get the upper hand. So what do you think I did? 
out of all the options I had in that situation, I did the first thing that came into my head. I smiled. I looked him dead in the eyes, and in the friendliest voice I could manage, I said, Hello. Nice day, hmm? Silence. He said nothing. A second later, he started slowly walking up the stairs, looking back at me every once in a while, confused. I stood dead still and never took my eyes off of him. He kept his head down and he started mumbling to himself. As he walked past me, I could smell the body odor and booze. He rounded that corner and I ran. I bolted through the reception area and burst out of the front entrance. To my right, the street was completely empty. To my left, a large crowd of people were staring at me in disbelief. Just a few meters away from me, one of the lecturers had his back pressed to the hotel's wall. He told me to come quickly, and I made my way into the crowd where I found all the students and guests gathered. After that, we waited for the man to be escorted out by police. All of us grabbed our things and we found a much nicer and safer hotel for the rest of the trip. I was later told that a few of the crowd saw me walk in and were calling to me, but I didn't hear or see them because I had my earbuds in and I was staring at my phone. What panic they must have had to see me walk in and shock to see me come back out. For some reason, I never told my fellow students or lecturers what happened. When they asked, I just said that I didn't see the guy. For the rest of the trip, the guy in the hotel was nicknamed the Mad Stabber. I didn't sleep very well for the rest of the trip. So this is to you, Mad Stabber, wherever you are. Let's never meet again. Last weekend, I was with my older sister, visiting her best friend since childhood, Kelly, who's very much like a second big sister to me. We were all catching up and downing wine, and I asked Kelly about her family. Her older brother I never knew well. He was always in and out of rehab or jail when we were kids. Her younger brother was actually my own age, and we were in the same class from elementary through middle school. He was quiet and chubby, a little socially awkward, and had a bowl cut. I always tried to be nice to him since our sisters were best friends, but he was never a part of my close group of friends. He was also extremely smart, and he actually got into Ivy League college. Nowadays, Kelly reported he was living in DC with a good job, but was struggling a lot with depression and other mental health issues. He was also growing a substantial amount of weed out of his apartment. Kelly was worried that he seemed very lost, and since their father's death a couple of years prior, he was no longer speaking to the rest of the family for some unknown reason. She was concerned that this isolation would compound his downward spiral. And then, very offhand and casually, she said, well, it's no wonder he's had all these issues since our mother slept in his bed until he was 13. What the fuck? I knew their family had issues, but Kelly's mom seemed like one of the normal ones. My sister asked if Kelly was saying that her mom had sexually abused her brother. She said, oh no, definitely not, but it was just very strange, Bates Motel kind of vibe. Like, who does that? A teenage boy has no business sleeping in the same bed at his, as his mother. It's just wrong. We were like, uh, yeah, that's insane. So I started flipping through my memory Rolodex of when we were kids to see if there were any signs. My sister asked what he was like at school and how come we weren't close. And then it hit me. It was a memory from childhood that I had filed into the back of my brain archive, one that before that moment I had never mentioned to another living soul. Flashback time. We were in maybe the third grade and we were at our community pool in the very deep end. We were playing sharks and minnows, just the two of us. Somehow there wasn't anyone else there. The lifeguard had stepped away, which was also unusual. 
I remember Kelly's little brother jumping off the diving board and me racing to the other side of the pool. He was trying to catch me, as was part of the game we were playing. We were both laughing. Everything seemed normal. He caught up to me and went to playfully dunk me under the water, which is a signal that he had won that round. But after a few seconds, I realized that he was still pushing me down. I double tapped his hand as if to say, hey bro, let me up. But instead, he brought his legs up to his chest and put his feet on my head. Then he straightened out his legs, pushing me down several more feet. I started to panic and tried to break away, but his feet were vice gripped to my head, and any time I tried to move out from under him, he would bring his leg up and push me right back down again. He was actually standing on my head. Finally, I jabbed my nails into his legs as hard as I could and scraped them across his flesh. He screamed and loosened his grip. I couldn't get to the surface fast enough. My lungs felt like they were on fire. Finally, I was above the water and choked for air like I was having an asthma attack. I turned to look at him, ready to unleash some serious rage for what he had just pulled. At the time, I still thought it was just a bad prank that had gone too far, but that was until I saw his face. Totally emotionless. Totally expressionless. Just staring at me. I expected him to start profusely apologizing, but he just sat there, holding onto the wall with a blank stare. It was like he was observing me, waiting to see how I was going to react. Looking back now, it felt like he tried to drown me as some kind of sick science experiment. I was so mind-fucked by all of it that instead of yelling at him, I just sort of stared back. At some point, I just turned around and casually made my way to the edge of the pool and climbed out. He never said a word. I have no idea why I didn't run to find an adult or call my parents or ever tell them or even any friends. I think I just very much wanted to pretend like it had never happened. I had no idea how to remotely handle what happened to me that day, so I just never did. So Bates Motel, Mama's Boy, who's probably a serial killer now, let's not ever meet again. Because now I remember, and I will tell everyone. When I was in the sixth grade, I had this friend, Jamie. At school, I didn't notice too much out of the ordinary about Jamie, but now looking back, I realized that she faced a lot of hardship. She would tell me things like how she had a fungus on her feet from not wearing clean socks and that she constantly got headaches because of her eyesight. She probably should have had glasses. For some reason, none of this ever set off any red flags in my 11-year-old brain, and so I jumped at the chance to come to her house for a sleepover. Jamie invited me to come over at the beginning of the school week. It was only after I received this invitation that she started to tell me more about her home life. She lived in a duplex with her mom and teenage brother. Her dad lived on the other side of the duplex. Her parents were divorced. I thought it was weird that the dad still lived in the same house as the mom, even though they were divorced, but I didn't press the matter. Jamie went on to tell me that her father had recently held a gun to her brother's head during a heated argument. This immediately set off alarm bells in my head. I had never been around guns before, but again, my 11-year-old brain didn't think to tell my mom about what Jamie had told me. I was just excited to be going to a sleepover. Friday rolled around, and my mom dropped me off at Jamie's house. The neighborhood was pretty run down, but not terrible. I walked into the house and met Jamie's mom. She was super nice and welcoming. And Jamie's dad was also there, and I was a little afraid of meeting him, but all of that was forgotten as Jamie and I went outside to play in the woods in her backyard. 
After a little while of running around in the woods, Jamie's dad called us inside. He said he needed to run an errand, and since Jamie's mom had gone out, I don't know where, we had to go with the dad so that we wouldn't be home alone. Jamie and I hopped in the back seat and off we went. We drove to a neighborhood. The dad parked the car and walked inside of the house. This wasn't the type of errand I thought he was going to be running. I can't remember how long we sat outside that house waiting. But it wasn't until many years later that I realized her dad was picking up drugs. I don't know what kind. I just remember Jamie telling me her dad did some kind of drug. Again, 11 year old brain. It gives me chills now, thinking about two young girls sitting outside while who knows what went on in that house. Anyway, after that, the dad took us back to Jamie's house and Jamie and I had a pretty fun evening. Jamie's brother's girlfriend took us to a theme park where Jamie's brother worked and we got to ride around in the bumper boats for free. Jamie and I were both exhausted when we got back to the house and we almost immediately fell asleep on the couch in the living room. All of a sudden, I woke up with a start at 7 a.m. to a loud bang. Jamie's dad was storming around the kitchen, slamming cabinet doors and screaming, where's my fucking coffee? The kitchen was connected to the living room where we were sleeping, and I didn't want the dad to see that I was awake, so I kept my eyes shut and I pretended to be asleep. I was terrified, remembering what Jamie had told me about the incident with the gun. The dad then walked into the mother's room, which was also connected to the living room, and was screaming at her about the coffee. The mom was half asleep, scolding the dad. I heard her say, that poor girl is probably out there pretending to be asleep right now. You've probably scared her half to death. My heart sank. Why did she have to mention me? The dad lowered his voice a bit, but he was still fuming about not knowing where his coffee was. After a few more agonizing minutes, the dad left for work and the house was quiet again. I did not go back to sleep, and I was very happy when my mom came to get me. It was only after my mom picked me up and we were home that I told her about everything, from the toe fungus to the gun incident to the coffee incident. She was obviously upset, but she wasn't mad at me. She told me very sternly that I would not be spending the night at Jamie's house again, but that Jamie could come to our house whenever she wanted. Jamie moved to schools before we started 7th grade, and I never saw or heard from her again. The only piece of news I heard about her was a few years later. I was in high school at this point, and my mom found a newspaper article that stated Jamie's mom had set their duplex on fire in order to get insurance money, and that Jamie's mom had been arrested. There was no mention of Jamie or her father. So suffice it to say, Jamie, wherever you are, I really hope you're okay. And Jamie's dad, and probably her mom too, let's never meet again. First things first, I gotta rip off the band-aid and admit that from late 2001 to mid-2003, when I was a teenager, I wrote fan fiction and posted it online. My stories weren't that great, but I made friends because I posted them, so I don't regret doing it. Even after I stopped posting stories, I was still active online, and instead I posted fan art and dumb stuff about the role plays I did with my buddies over on DeviantArt. Cringe, cringe. Maybe I sound like a lame fangirl, but whatever. I was having fun. Fast forward to 2008 when I got a PM on DeviantArt that was, well, I really wasn't expecting online life to take such a strange turn on that particular random day. However, the writer, Ari, began her missive by informing me, a complete stranger, that she was seriously mentally ill. She listed a wide variety of disorders that included schizophrenia, which had tormented her all of her life. She then said she was scared to write to me like this, but she had to, so she could move on. Move on from what, you ask? Well, 
from her hatred of me, of course. Uh, Ari wrote that she had hated me for a long time, based on the fanfiction I wrote because my stories terrified her. Okay, now let's be really clear here. I wrote stories about characters from cartoons and one comic book. One of the characters from that comic was a violent and terrible person and I wrote him as such. But that was not what was scaring her. No, no, no. Ari was scared because she was in love with said violent character John and believed they were destined for each other and that he talked to her in her head. And then she read my fan fiction and suddenly John stopped talking to her and she knew it was because he was talking to me instead. She was absolutely certain that I had stolen her true love from her. She said that after that, she developed a belief that I was the arbiter of her reality. More generally, that's a direct quote and I will never forget that phrase, that I was capable of reaching into her mind and not only reading, but taking away her precious thoughts. This caused her so much anguish and suffering. However, she went on, that deep down she also knew that this was a delusion caused by her mental illness. Ari closed her PM by begging me to respond to her, to confirm that I was just a normal girl so she could get past this trauma I had caused her and be happy again. Now, I have to again rip off a band-aid of inviting judgment here by admitting that sometimes I'm a complete dumbass. I am also a soft-hearted person, and the idea that someone could have been harmed by the goofy crap stories I'd posted years earlier made me kind of sad, especially since she had legitimate, at least according to her, mental illnesses. So I did a soft-hearted but ultimately dumbass thing, and I responded. Yes, yes, I was a normal teenage girl when I posted that stuff, and now I am a normal early 20s woman with no mind-stealing superpowers. Also, I don't know you and had no idea you existed until you sent me this, so how could I have singled you out to hurt you with my fan fictions? Please don't worry about me. And I thought, what a kind person I am. That will surely be the end of it. <laughs> Wrong. Ari replied to me using a different, upbeat, and cheerful tone, saying she was so glad I wrote back to her, because now she knew she didn't have to fear me and we could just be friends. She loved my fan fictions, honestly. And by the way, what was my real name so she could find me on Facebook? Uh, excuse me? Uh, no. A dumbass I may be, but I ain't that stupid. I told her I didn't have a Facebook. A lie and that I was busy with school, a truth. So I wouldn't be on deviant art a whole lot, a uh, half truth. But I wished her good luck with her mental health recovery and hoped that she would have a good life, a truth. I mean, so far she just seemed trouble and weird, but I wouldn't have wished harm on her. I didn't get a response to that. However, a few months later, I got a deviant art PM from another account I didn't know that simply asked, Hey, uh, how do you get your characters to talk for you? Now, I hadn't posted any fan fiction for years, but I was still participating in fandom and talked online about writing. And I honestly thought this question was about writing, specifically dialogue. I mulled over how to respond and ended up not answering right away. I went back to my PMs a few days later and saw that I had another new message. This one saying with many exclamation points and cry typing style misspellings that I had to answer and I had to teach this stranger how to talk to my characters and that I didn't know how long this user had suffered because of me. Oh my goodness, I wonder who it was using another account. And guess what? I was still a goddamn dumbass. So I answered the first message, but sort of detachedly ignoring the desperation of the second message, and just kind of giving tips for how to learn a character's voice, which is a writing term, and how to write dialogue for them. 
Once again, I got a very chipper reply, including a confession that, yeah, it was Ari, like we didn't know. And she just loved talking to me and thought I was so nice and such a good friend to be so patient with her and answer her burning questions about how to talk to my, yes, specifically my, characters. Because you see, she had realized that she was not just in love with John, but with my John from my stupid fan fiction. And now she could talk to him anytime because we were friends. I got the idea that she was not asking to roleplay and instead thought she would be able to communicate directly with this once removed fictional character now. But I feigned ignorance and said something like, uh, our role-playing group is kind of private and not accepting new members, but I hope I answered your question. Please have a good day. Because see, I did not really want to be friends with someone who A, seemed to believe I was somehow responsible for her mental illness and mental health despite not knowing her from Adam and having only spoken to her twice, and B, had already told me once that she hated me and thought I could control her reality. On the kinder side of things, I honestly didn't think continuing to converse would be good for either of us. On the meaner side, I just really, really didn't want to interact with this person anymore, and I felt I had already done more than enough to help this stranger. Okay, so she stopped responding to me, and I thought this strange interlude in my life was over. Plot twist. Now, fast forward seven entire years to early July 2015, at which time I had moved my main online presence to Tumblr. I had left a note on my DeviantArt account in 2011 when I moved, giving my new Tumblr screen name so my fandom buddies could easily find me. At this point, I had not posted any fanfiction for over 10 years. I was also not talking much at all of online about John, except to reblog the occasional post someone else made about the comic he was from, as you do on Tumblr. Suddenly, I received an anonymous ask, and that ask said in no uncertain terms that I was the cause of the asker's suffering because I had callously disregarded others' feelings. It closed with some kind of weird threat I can't remember exactly what now because I instinctively deleted the ask due to being unnerved. I guessed that it could be Ari based on the typing style and the fact that there couldn't possibly be two people in the world who thought that I made them suffer through my fiction, right? But it had been seven years, so I wasn't entirely sure. And then I did a third dumbass thing. I made a post that said something along the lines of, to the Anon that just sent me a vaguely threatening ask, sorry if anything I've posted has upset you, please let me know if I can tag my post in a certain way so that you can block whatever content you find distressing. A couple of days later, I got another anonymous ask, calling me a prattling, ostentatious idiot. That is a direct quote. And saying it doesn't work that way and strong emotions cannot just be blocked. The message went on. You stole him away from me and I have been living in turmoil since you don't care. Yeah, definitely Ari. There was no question about it after that. After all, I haven't stolen anyone else's fictional boyfriend. I mean, not that I know of. I turned off the anonymous asks. I also went back to my old, untouched DeviantArt account where I found a comment on my front page from yet a third account there that said, if you still talk to him, tell him that I love him and that I always will. He was the first man I ever loved and it was your version of him that I loved above all. I have been jealous, angry at you, angry at myself, depressed, psychotic, I tore myself to shreds over him and my heart aches and cries. The first cut is the deepest. I love you, John. The date on this message was June 28th, 2015, just a few days before the first anonymous ask on Tumblr. 
I did a little internet sleuthing, just a simple Google of Ari's known usernames, and found her Fur Affinity account, where she had posted screeds in her journal about hating anyone else who wrote or drew anything about John. Okay. I also discovered through this Google search that I was not completely special in triggering Ari's ire, and that she had also gone after another person on Tumblr in much the same way, demanding answers to emotionally charged asks, assuming friendship where there wasn't any, and then stalking the person using multiple accounts and email addresses and accusing them of harming her. This other person had amassed a true collection of screenshots of Ari's behavior, and it was really super not good. Anyway, I figured since I'd blocked the anonymous asks, maybe she would just go away, but say it with me, wrong. Ari's next wave of shit began in 2016 when someone started reblogging my personal text posts with cryptic comments like, you have a beautiful soul. The username was nothing like Ari or any of the other account names that she had used before, so I thought it was someone new being socially awkward. But after a few months of this, I received a message from this account through Tumblr's chat function that let the cat out of the bag. The person said something like, I'm a British female creature with, insert, same litany of mental illnesses from Ari's first PM in 2008, and I'm so scared of dying alone and friendless. I used to read your fan fiction, and it always made me feel better. I think you're an amazing woman and would like to get to know you better. Please, I'm, I'm begging you. Don't leave me alone in the dark. Well, this sure sounded a lot like Ari to me. This was confirmed when I went to the person's Tumblr and saw they had recently posted something passive-aggressive about that other Tumblr user Ari was known to stalk. And if that wasn't enough, they also had a lot of weird, innuendo-laden posts about John and a couple other characters, including Sherlock and a man I didn't recognize, and who they claimed to have legally married. It was at that point that I finally decided to stop being a soft-hearted dumbass. I blocked the account that sent me the chat message right away, without responding. Over the next several months, Ari attempted to contact others on Tumblr who it was obvious I talked to a lot. My girlfriend, our best friend, etc. She sent them chat messages like the one paraphrased above, hilarious in the case of my girlfriend who never wrote any fanfiction begging for their relationship, and also, you know, just casually asking what I was doing, whether they could get me to talk to her, that sort of thing. I know my girlfriend and best friend blocked her too after they asked me who the hell this person was, and I told them the whole story. I also discovered that on Tumblr, you can use an option to allow chat messages only from people you follow. With that account blocked and no one that I don't follow able to send me chat messages, I thought again that surely this weird nonsense would end, but you know the song by now. Wrong. See, the thing about Tumblr, if you're not familiar with the website, is that if you block someone, they just can't interact with your posts or follow you. A block causes someone to auto-unfollow you, and they won't see your posts on their dash or feed. They also won't be able to send you asks. However, they can still go to your actual blog, username.tumblr.com, and see everything you post. If they try to interact with any of your posts on your blog, like reply, reblog, like it, etc., they won't be able to which will of course conveniently tip them off that you blocked them. So beginning in 2018, Ari engaged in a whirlwind of activity. She made a new account, sent me an ask or 15, saying things varying from, please talk to me, I'm harmless, you don't know how hard it is to be me, to things like, I'm so scared of the darkness, to humans are social animals and I'm dying without you, to, I guess you like psychos like John, but you can't handle a real psycho like me, all the way to, I want to kidnap you far away in a happy ending, my darling. 
true misery style shit. So I blocked that account immediately. And she made a new account and reblogged some post I had made a while back about John's comic book with a comment like, my first love, the first cut is the deepest, before sending me multiple asks, all saying, you stole him from me. So I blocked that account immediately. So of course she made another one, made some meme generator sparkly pictures of rats and spiders with text like, I just want to sit next to you and be your friend. I'm not scary and posted them with at my username. So this mention would show up in my dashes activity. So I blocked that account. So she made a new one, posted a quote from my favorite author, which is well known info. I post about him frequently and sent me a couple asks saying that this author would disagree with how I was treating her by continuing to block and shun her friendship when she was harmless and just thought I was an amazing person. So I blocked that account. Mate, did you forget you called me a prattling ostentatious idiot and threatened me because I sure haven't. This went on for 10 accounts, one of which had the blog title in huge letters at the top. Hello, my nickname reserved only for close friends. One of which she inundated with photos of herself glaring at the camera. My first looks at her face, and I don't like to judge people on appearance, but this girl has a really creepy glare and also looks like she's probably not showered in weeks. Of course, she put at my username at each one so that I would see it. She only ever used one of these accounts to actually post reblog and like things from other people like a seemingly normal user, albeit one who made some questionable comments sometimes. All the rest only existed to bother me. I started trying to report her to Tumblr after the third or fourth time for making multiple accounts solely to evade my blocks, but if you know anything about Tumblr, you can guess they didn't respond with more than an automated, okay, we'll look into this. In the meantime, have you tried blocking this user? <sighs> anyway, throughout 2018, I just had to deal with the fact that anytime I saw a little red flag above my ask box icon, it would probably be something creepy and either threatening or passive aggressive from Ari that would put me on edge for a few hours and Remind me that no matter what I do on Tumblr, she can read everything I post. I haven't gotten anything from her so far in 2019, but I figure as long as she's out there, there's always the chance that she'll come back. Maybe not right away, maybe not until another 10 years from now. But let me just say, Ari, you fucking weirdo. I'm genuinely sorry about your mental illnesses, and I hope you get the help you need for them. But while they may explain some of your behavior, they certainly don't excuse it. I am not and never will be your friend because you are not harmless. You made me heavily curtail my social interaction on Tumblr by cutting off a couple methods of communication that could have been used to make new friends. And you made me worried about ever talking there about a comic I enjoy. You made it so that any time I see I have an ask, my heart rate goes up because it might be more of your disturbing bullshit. You've harassed my loved ones and also other strangers who probably didn't do anything to deserve it. And so much more. I don't control your reality, but if I did, you can bet I'd use that power to ensure that we never, ever meet. I was staying at a Westin in Atlanta. It's not a St. Regis, but it's not a Motel 6 either. I stay at hotels a lot, and I generally think of them as being safe places. On the day of this event, I was terribly hungover. So hungover that I could barely get out of bed. But I had a hair appointment that I'd already made a 50% deposit on, so I essentially had to pull myself together. I threw up several times before I got there, however, I eventually made it. Afterward, I threw up on the way back. It was that bad. When I made it back to the hotel, it was between 5 and 6 o'clock at night. It wasn't even nightfall yet. 
I got on the elevator to go up to my room and it was packed with people. I was visibly sick, sweating, and trying to prevent myself from throwing up in a crowded elevator. I couldn't hold it in long enough to make it to my floor, so I got off at the first chance. I was on my knees, puking into a trash can by the elevator before the doors even closed. While puking, I noticed a man hovering behind me. He was well-dressed and about 45 to 50 years old. Out of embarrassment, I apologized for throwing up in public in between heaves. He said, I saw you on the elevator, but I didn't realize we were on the same floor. Still vomiting, I informed him that I wasn't on this floor. He told me that he was going to go get me some help. Attempting to decline his offer, he just grabbed me by the elbow, pulled me from the ground, and started to drag me down the hall. I was really out of it, and I didn't understand what was happening for about 15 seconds. By then, we were nearly halfway down the hall. I quickly realized that housekeeping had gone home for the day. There was no staff or patrons on the floor that I could see. I started getting really loud, and he stopped dragging me but he still didn't release me, so I had to kind of wiggle away. I ran back to the elevator and got on. Just before the doors closed, he put his arm in and boarded the elevator with me. I pressed the button to my floor and he got off with me. My room was at the end of the hall. I quickly walked back to my room, got the key to open my door and tried to close it, only to find that his foot was blocking me from doing so. A small struggle that lasted about eight seconds ensued. I eventually was able to close the door and put the security latch on, and then I slid to the floor and started crying. Who was this man? Why was he doing this? And if he wanted to help me, then why didn't he? What was he trying to do? I don't know, but I certainly hope that we never meet again. This happened in 2016. While I was at university in a big city, I lived with four friends in student housing. The house was a three-story building with the kitchen, living room, and one of the bedrooms on the bottom floor, two bedrooms and the bathroom on the second floor, and the final two bedrooms on the top floor. My bedroom was on the second floor, directly above the living room and kitchen. This is important for later. Even though I had some of the best days of my life in this house, that all came to an end in one night. I remember it was about March time because we had gone out for St. Patrick's Day a couple of days before. At the time, there were only two people in the house, myself and my friend John, whose bedroom was on the top floor. I remember when I was woken at about 4.30 in the morning, it was by ruffling downstairs. This didn't actually concern me at the time since John had part-time work on the local trains and usually started his shifts at about five. I assumed he was downstairs eating breakfast because I had come in from nights out in the past and would meet him on his way out of the house. For some reason, completely out of character for me, I decided to go down and have breakfast with him, as I wasn't doing anything that day and I wanted to speak to him before he went away. As I walked down our carpeted stairs, I decided that it would be funny if I scared John since he wouldn't be expecting me down at this time of the morning. So I threw open the living room door which led to the kitchen and yelled out, didn't expect me, did. I froze. There were three hooded figures in our living room staring right at me. My breath caught in my throat. I quickly glanced around the room and noticed that they had gathered all my PS4 stuff and had put it in my friend's guitar bag. One of them had the guitar in his hands, but the thing that made my blood turn cold was that one of them had a knife in their hand. We just stared at each other for what must have been five seconds, and the thought of getting stabbed was swimming through my brain, and I knew I had to think of something to get them to at least get out of my house before I called the police. Eventually, I managed to blurt out, guys, I've already called the cops and they're on their way. If you want any chance to not get arrested, I suggest you leave everything and get out now. They started looking at each other and I thought, oh shit, 
They know I'm lying. Oh my god, I'm gonna die. Then the one with the knife, who I guess was the leader, pointed to the floor and they dropped all the stuff. And then he led them out the front door. I backed up the stairs as they went to the door, never losing eye contact or turning my back to them. They then went outside, and once I was sure they weren't on the other side of the door, I slammed it shut. I then started crying and hyperventilating as the whole experience was the most traumatic thing I'd ever gone through. After I calmed myself, I ran upstairs to get John to call the police, and they came and investigated the property. They determined that one of us forgot to properly lock the kitchen window, and that's how they gained access to the property. They stole some minor things, phone chargers, power banks, stuff like that, but nothing major. Called my flatmates and told them the situation. Then I packed up a lot of my stuff and went back to live with my parents for a week, and even then I wouldn't stay in that house on my own for about a month afterwards. From what I heard from the police, they never caught the guys, and that ultimately led to the decision for us to get a flat in another part of the city on the off chance that those guys turned up again. I have since developed compulsive habits from this experience. I always check that everything is locked, and I even lock my bedroom at night, something I never did in the past. For a while, there were nights I would hear innocent enough things outside, but would become extremely paranoid and grab my hurling stick, which is an Irish sport thing, kind of like a baseball bat, and have it under my hand, under the sheets, so I could defend myself if someone came into the house. I still have nightmares about how that scenario could have played out differently, and it messed me up for at least six months afterwards. If you go to university and you don't know the area very well, always take precautions to make sure you're safe. And hooded guys, let's never meet again. This story happened seven years ago, but it feels like it was just yesterday. July 20th, 2012. I remember the exact date because it was the same day as the shooting at the Batman premiere in Aurora, Colorado, which is oddly relevant. The day started out pretty normal for me. I was a patient tech at a dialysis clinic in rural Alabama and up way too early to open the clinic. The first thing I saw after shutting off my alarm at 2.45 in the morning was a text message from my cousin Taylor, who lives in Colorado but not directly in Aurora saying, you're going to see the news about a shooting in Colorado, but Meg and I are safe. Naturally, I flip on the television, soaking up the horror while throwing on my scrubs and getting angry at mankind. Great start to a Friday. I pull up to my clinic and notice that the nurse that opens with me isn't there yet. No biggie, because I'm a little early, so I grab my bag and head in to get started. I finish up my prep work in the water room. You have to do all sorts of testing on the water that you use with dialysis patients. And I go out on the treatment floor. Still no nurse. The clinical manager walks in about that time and says, Hey, Jennifer, where's Nurse Nancy at? To which I replied, I have no idea. I'll call her. After trying her house and cell without getting an answer, I'm getting a little peeved. This particular nurse was picking up night shifts at the nursing home and had a bad habit of oversleeping. My CM says, why don't you drive past her place, which was one street over from the clinic, and check to see if she's even there. Now, before anyone thinks, why didn't she go, let me explain something. It was almost time for the patients to come in, but a nurse has to be in the building in order to even let them in the lobby. My CM was a nurse, so she could at least let everyone in while we figured out what Nurse Nancy's deal was. Anyway, I agree to ride by because it's literally a stone's throw away, and because if I saw her car was there, I was going to lay on the horn until she got up. I pull up to her house, and she's there, so I deploy my I'm honking mad tactic until she pokes her head out the door, apologizing and swearing she'll be at the clinic in five minutes. Cool. So I head back to the clinic, park in the still empty parking lot, and start to get out of my car. In the time it took me to open my door, stand up, and turn around, 
there's this guy right inside my door blocking my way going, where's your bag? I'm so confused. I thought he was a patient's spouse or son or friend initially and I said, it's inside, why? I started to move forward and that's when I realized that there was a knife poking me in the chest. Is this real life? We never worry about thieves or drug addicts because our clinic has no narcotics and nothing to steal. I mean, unless you're really into shitty 10-inch televisions that may or may not have gotten puked or bled on. I know only a second or two went by, but it felt like eons. I remember my ears started ringing and my dad's voice saying, if you get cornered by someone, scream obscenities and make noise. To shock them, I guess. I don't know. He was probably being sarcastic. And then hit them as hard as you can and run. My chest felt like it was on fire. Why me? Why today? Why did that guy shoot up a theater? What is wrong with people? The next thing I know, I'm screaming words I don't normally say. I slammed my right hand up under his knife while swinging a wild uppercut with my left fist. Pow, right in the kisser. He drops the knife and immediately starts backpedaling. I'm screaming and yelling after him and he's grabbing his face while breaking into a run. I watch him dash out the back of the lot and it hits me. The adrenaline rush is over and I'm beating on the clinic door because my hands are shaking too badly to get my key in the lock. The CM lets me in and right before the door shuts, I see nurse fucking Nancy pull up. I'm kind of yelling what happened because my ears are still ringing and the CM is freaking out and calling 911. Then I look at my hands. My right palm is cut and the three knuckles on my left are split. Nurse Nancy is inside now and I'm trying really hard not to throttle her. I know it wasn't exactly her fault, but I'm just going to blame my reaction on the nerves. The cops show up, get the run down, and insist on taking me to the ER because A, I might need stitches, and B, I'm not hysterical, so they think I'm in shock. I did need sutures, just some liquid stitch, which is sort of medical super glue. But I did have to get a tetanus shot because, to quote the doc, the human mouth is a cesspit of bacteria and filth. Awesome. Very uplifting. Now for some actual uplifting information. I had given a pretty decent description of the dude and because I had landed a decent blow to the face, the officers thought it wouldn't be hard to find him. Well, guess what? They didn't have to look. An officer was sitting in the parking lot of the clinic when he sees a guy matching the description walking through looking under cars. The cop is not in an unmarked squad car and thinks, surely no one is that dumb. But lo and behold, when he gets closer, the guy has a busted upper lip. Apparently, this guy was trying to find the knife he dropped and maybe thought a Darwin Award was under the car, who knows. Officer Friendly brings him in for questioning. It turns out that this upstanding fellow has been in and out of prison quite a bit. He admits to everything. Well, except that a 5 foot 4 inch, 115 pound girl got the drop on him and pleads guilty. He was given a heavy sentence because of his lengthy criminal history and, you know, poorly attempted armed robbery. I don't remember when he'll get out, but I'm fairly certain we won't be meeting again. I live in the Bay Area near San Francisco, and I take the BART into the city three to four times a month for work. For those who are unfamiliar, the BART is basically our shittier version of the subway. I'm very attentive on public transit, as I'm a woman in her late 30s who is deeply aware of how many creepers are lurking around. I always wear earbuds, but I never have music playing, so I can hear what's going on around me, but I have a reasonable excuse not to engage in conversations with strangers. I guess I just have one of those faces, since weirdos always feel comfortable blurting out whatever bizarre bullshit is going through their heads to me, while I'm internally screaming, no sir, I don't care how many ghosts are braiding your beard, and no, cell phones won't give you ball cancer. Anyway, I left my meeting on the late side, and it's around 8.45 at night. 
I get on my train, which is delightfully empty, thanks to the end of rush hour and spring break, and I'm able to get a seat right away. I pop my decoy earbuds in, pull up a phone game, and start to settle into the ride. When the train stops at the second to last San Francisco stop before heading to Oakland, a few people board my car. One of them is an older man in a suit who decides to sit right next to me instead of the many other open seats. Cool bro. He immediately pulls out a laptop, sets it screen open on the empty seat across from us like a makeshift desk. He types for a few minutes as the train pulls into the last stop before we head through the six to seven minute long ride through the Trans Bay tube toward Oakland. At this point, I'm just like, all right, cool. Another entitled douchebag taking up more than his allotted amount of space, but I'm not creeped out yet. As we enter the tube, he stands up and walks away from his backpack and laptop, heading to the opposite end of the car to stand. I notice that he's left a browser up with pornographic images displayed, and I roll my eyes and go back to focusing on Candy Crush. A minute or so later, I hear a male voice behind me saying, excuse me, and I ignore it. Don't want to talk, don't want to look at train porn, I just want to beat this level. The voice says it again, this time tapping my shoulder. I turn to see a youngish guy glaring at me. Do you mind closing that? He asks, gesturing to the laptop. We're in public. I explained that it was not mine, but belongs to the guy who is no longer in our car? I go to point him out, but he was gone. The young guy and I decided to close the laptop and slide it into the backpack because neither of us is about that train porn life. At the first Oakland stop, young guy gets off, leaving me and just a couple of other people in the car. I move to a different seat away from the backpack because I don't want to be responsible for it. I get settled and see train porn come back into the car and head toward his stuff. He sits down, opens his backpack, and resumes laptop activities as though nothing happened. I try to immerse myself in Candy Crush again, counting the minutes until I can get off the train. A few minutes go by, but I can feel, truly and honestly feel, him staring at me. I don't look because I assume he'll interpret it as an invitation to talk, but it's getting more intense. At the next stop, I decided to change cars completely. I move to the next one, sit, and try to shake it off. Only a couple of stops to go. As the train takes off, someone comes through the connecting door. A woman about my age sees me and gestures for me to take out my earbuds. I want you to know that I called BART police, she says. I assume that train porn noticed I had moved his stuff and was trying to accuse me of stealing, but I was wrong. I asked her to explain, and she informs me that she saw train porn taking a lot of pictures of me with his phone. The woman was standing behind him and noticed that he was making noises and touching himself while he did it. She asks me if I'm okay, if I want her to sit with me, etc. Because women are literally the best to each other in scary situations. I decided to get off at the next stop and lift home. She says she'll watch through the door to see if train porn tries to leave too. At the stop, she says he's still sitting, so I quickly thank her profusely and dart off the train. I'm on the platform for maybe three seconds and starting to walk away when I hear a shout. I look back and train porn is staring at me out of the window smiling with his hand down his pants. Ugh. Thankfully, the train departed with him still on it. I ran up the stairs, called my boyfriend, and he came to pick me up. I told the station agent what had happened, and she said I could wait at her booth until my ride arrived, which I gratefully did. I know this isn't necessarily life-threatening and nothing quote-unquote happened to me, but it also kind of did. I felt so violated. I reported it to BART police, but let's be real, nothing's gonna happen. Now I'm just feeling extremely angry with a hint of bloodthirst for the man who took my pictures, so train porn, I hope we never officially meet, 
But if we do, I hope it's in a boxing ring where I can teach you a lesson about perving out on non-consenting people. I always tell this as a cautionary tale that has actually happened to me, especially in light of all the terrifying, heartbreaking news stories of girls who get into Ubers and are never seen again. This happened when I was in college. It's one of the bigger party schools with an entire street of bars you can wander to and from. My boyfriend, now fiance, had gone back to his hometown for the weekend, so I decided to go out with some friends. I'm sure you can see where this is going. I had a bit too much to drink and was on the edge of a blackout, knowing with my whole mind, body, and soul that I did not want to become a liability for my friends for the rest of the night. I told them I was going to Uber home. My friends insisted on coming with me, but selfishly, I wanted to call my boyfriend when I got home and have a house to myself, so I told them all no. But I took a screenshot of my driver's name and info on the app and sent it to them. When he got close, I hugged them all and walked out the door. Like I said earlier, it's a big party school with lots of bars in one area. So the entire strip is lined with Ubers from about 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. It was almost bar close, so there were a ton. And look, I was hammered. I don't even know what a Toyota Yaris looks like at the best of times. So as I'm searching, a man rolled down his window and asked if I was waiting for an Uber. I said yes. He told me that he wasn't my Uber, but if I canceled my ride and accepted his, he would take me home. I was already thinking of the leftovers that I had in my fridge at this point, so I agreed, canceled my Uber, and made sure that I accepted his ride instead. He was super nice, and he was an Uber. I've heard stories of fake Uber drivers, so I did make sure he was legitimate. He called me beautiful a few times right off the bat, but hey, I was a girl in college, I got that a lot. I remember we talked about our favorite books since I told him I was an English major and he was super interested in listening to me talk about tutoring ESL students in my free time on campus. He was an immigrant who had to learn to speak English, so we lamented about how awful it must be to learn such an intricate language, but how rewarding the successes were in the end. When he missed the turn from my apartment complex, I figured it must have been because he was distracted by our conversation. I politely pointed out that he missed the turn, and he said that he would turn back around. Rather than making a U-turn though, he took the longest way to get back to my apartment. I was still in familiar territory, so at least I knew that he was going in the right direction, but I was starting to get nervous. It was around 2.30am at this time, and it was super dark and no one was awake, let alone outside. When he missed the turn in again, I asked if I could just get out and make it back on my own. He seemed kind of offended, like he was surprised that I wasn't as engrossed in our conversation as he was. I kind of jokingly told him that I was a broke college student and he was kind of racking up my bill during a surge. That seemed to straighten things out a little bit. He was all, oh, I completely understand, and turned back toward my complex. I was honestly so freaked out and drunk at this point that as soon as he pulled into my complex, I was like, okay, right here is fine, thank you, and pulled on the door handle when he came to a stop. It didn't open. I hit the little lock latch, still nothing. Let's go get coffee, he said. He clicked the button in the app to say that the trip was completed and clicked out of the app. At this point, I'm just trying not to look as freaked out as I feel. I told him I was tired, and it was late, and coffee was literally the last thing I needed at that moment. I tried the door again, just to make sure I wasn't drunk and handling the door handle wrong. It still didn't open. You know, we should just sit here and talk until you're feeling better, he was explaining to me. We can go somewhere more private, too, if you'd like. Do you live alone up there? At this point, I'm frantically digging through my purse for my phone. Fuck being polite. When he asked what I was doing, I told him I promised my boyfriend I'd call him once I was home safely. Wrong thing to say. 
he got pissed that I had a boyfriend and didn't tell him about it. He asked what his name was, what he did for a living, and where he was right now at this very second. When I gave a half-hearted answer to each of his questions, he got even angrier. He demanded to know why a boyfriend of mine would be stupid enough to leave his girl alone with another man, him. He repeated it twice, and at this point I was just trying not to cry. When I figured my phone must have fallen under the seat, I started digging around down there. He demanded to know what I was doing. I gave my best impression of a genuine laugh and said that I dropped my phone. He told me to stop digging around in his things immediately, so I did. Mind you, I'm still drunk as hell at this point. I was just trying to keep my shit together and not vomit or pass out. I tried the door a third time, still nothing. He asked if I wanted to get coffee again, even kind of begged a little. I told him no, that I just needed to sleep. He asked if I lived alone again. I lied and told him that I had a roommate. He asked if it was my boyfriend, and I said no. He kind of got angry again, and then straight up asked if I'd made my boyfriend up. I told him no, of course I hadn't, and he got angrier, and again asked why he would leave me alone with another man like this. Now, I'm usually pretty good at reading people, and I got the vibe that this guy thought he was a knight compared to my boyfriend. So I lied. Through my teeth. I told him I was going to break things off with my boyfriend, that we weren't even really that serious, and that yeah, he was an idiot to leave me alone like this. Thank whatever fucking god was watching over me, but that did it. He calmed down and said that changed everything. He asked if I wanted to get coffee again, and I changed my answer to not tonight. He asked for my number and I gave it to him. He called to make sure it was my real number. My phone buzzed from between my seat and the door and I fished it out. He grabbed my phone for me and demanded that I show him my boyfriend's contact information. When I did, he deleted it and gave me a big smile. Feels good, doesn't it? I said, yeah, it sure does. He put his number in my phone and gave it back. I told him goodnight in the hopes that he would release me and he told me that he'd like to talk for just a little longer. I had to stay in a locked car with him until 4.30 in the morning. I don't even remember what we talked about. He asked if he could hold my hand at one point, to which I said I needed to break up with my boyfriend officially first before I did anything with another man, and thankfully he liked that answer. When he finally let me out, the door was child locked, so it could only be opened from the outside. The windows were locked too, by the way. I walked up the wrong building steps on purpose and crouched down in the shadows of some random person's door until he drove off. I sat for another 10 minutes and then sprinted to my apartment. After crying on the floor in my kitchen for a while, I called my boyfriend and explained what happened to him. His response was the one I got from everyone when I tell this story. Report that fucker to Uber. But even though he didn't know which building in my complex I lived in, he still knew where I lived. I was terrified of seeing him again. I was terrified of calling an Uber. To this day, I refuse to Uber alone and I make sure I have my phone in my hand every time I get into an Uber now. I realize that this could have been a lot worse, and maybe he was a good guy with the wrong line of thinking, and he did mean well, but I doubt it, and I was terrified that I wasn't going to make it to my apartment that night. So please be cautious when getting into an Uber, and uh, Uber driver from hell, I know we've technically met before, but I'm going to have to take a rain check on that coffee date forever. Let's never meet again. When I was about 16 years old, I decided to get myself a job for the summer. This would be the very first job I had ever had, as my mom usually would provide me with money. I was pretty clueless on where to start, so my aunt did the heavy work and found me a job babysitting for one of her customers. 
She works at a salon and the customer's name is Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a Nigerian man who always goes there to get a cut. She tells me he's extremely nice and she presumes he's well off because he always tips well. I am excited because babysitting for a couple of hours and making good money sounds like music to my 16 year old ears. So about a week before I'm supposed to start babysitting Jeremiah's kids for the summer, I meet up with him. He introduces himself to me and wants me to meet the kids on a short trial basis for about an hour a day from Monday to Friday. He agrees to pay $30 for the hour as he was paying me $10 for each child and there were three. I meet with the kids and they seem pretty easygoing. There was a two-year-old, Felicia, a five-year-old, Jeremiah Jr., and a seven-year-old named Heaven. All in all, it seemed like it was going to be a good summer, but it wasn't. The first few days of the trial went great. I would come see the kids and take them to the park or play a game with them until I had to go back home. However, on the Friday of that week, it started to get weird. I came to the house as I usually did and greeted Jeremiah and took the kids to the park as I had been doing for almost four days now routinely. However, this day would not be like the rest. Jeremiah calls me 15 minutes into the day, screaming at me to bring back his children. I was terrified that something had happened, so panicking, I pack up the kids and we go back to the house. Once we're in the home, he tells the kids to go to their rooms, and this is where the horror begins. He tells me that I am no longer allowed to take his kids to the park. Confused, I ask why. He explains to me that his ex-wife often goes to the park and watches the kids, and that he's afraid for their safety. Well, let me tell you, that is news to me, as when I first met him, he specifically told me that he and his wife had gotten a divorce. Why? Because she had been bringing men back to the home, and he had suspected one of them of doing things to heaven. He also told me that his ex had lost her custodial rights and was in prison, so you could see where I was confused. Nonetheless, whatever doubt and confusion I had in my mind, I pushed it down and I swore to him that if I ever did see her around the house, I would call the police, as he had also previously told me he has a restraining order out on her. Then he tells me not to ever call the police if I see her, but only to call him. Again, I push the rising doubt out of my mind and reluctantly agree. The first month of the summer goes relatively well. I spend about four hours a day with them, and during those four hours, those kids are preoccupied with their gaming system or riding their dirt bike or doing whatever in their massive house. However, once July rolls around, things start to get even weirder. Jeremiah starts coming home from work early on Wednesdays. That's not the strange part. The strange part is that he would come home early from work and expect me to remain at the home until my day was done. He also starts to recruit me to do things with the kids and him, like going clothes shopping, going to the doctors, going to the supermarket, and even to the movies. I was starting to feel more like a nanny than a babysitter. When I would express the idea of going home, as I clearly wasn't needed, he would always get upset and guilt me into staying. The kids need you. This is your responsibility, he would say. I was annoyed, but I let it go, as I'm only spending four hours a day there and I'm getting paid well. My sister, Michelle, on the other hand, would openly tell me how weird she finds Jeremiah and how she had thought he was trying to groom me into being the kid's surrogate parent and new wife. I laugh off the idea as nothing mildly inappropriate had ever happened, but that would change. One day, I came to the home as per usual and Jeremiah leaves to work. About an hour into me being there, I hear a knock on the door, and before I could ask who it is, Heaven sprints to the door and swings it open. To my surprise, it's a woman. I ask her who she is and she tells me that she's the kid's mother. 
Now I'm shocked and frightened as this woman isn't supposed to have any contact with these kids. I tell her Jeremiah is at work and that I'm watching the kids in his absence. She gives me a very cynical look and tells me that I can go home since she's there now. I told her that Jeremiah had told me not to let her in if she visits and that she needs to leave. I half expected her to curse me out, but to my surprise, she said, fine, kissed the kids goodbye and left. I quickly, in a panic, phone Jeremiah and tell him of the recent occurrence. He doesn't seem upset at all. In fact, he doesn't even seem surprised. He calmly thanks me for alerting him. And as he was ending the call, he says that I'm a good girl. Again, I'm a bit sketched out, but proceed to continue to watch the kids. One day while I was there, I become curious on the nature of the relationship between the mother and the kids since they didn't seem to really miss her at all while she was away. Therefore, I do the only logical thing I can do and proceed to pry answers out of Heaven and Jeremiah Jr. To my utter disbelief, what I find out is shocking. It turns out the reason why the kids barely seem to miss their mother is due to her never being gone. They tell me their mother comes home every day right when Wheel of Fortune is coming on, which is usually around 7.30 p.m. I ask them if she stays or goes to her own home and they tell me that she sometimes spends the night in their dad's room, but when he's mad at her, she has to leave. So I ask the next logical question. I ask Heaven why her dad is often angry at her mom, and she tells me it was because mom isn't a good listener. Right then and there, I got a chill. Because up until that point, it seems like I'm putting together a puzzle, but none of the pieces are matching. I start rewinding to certain things Jeremiah would say to me and certain things he would do that at the time I didn't think much of. For instance, every time I was playing with Felicia when he was around, he would always tell me that I was a good mom. Not that I would be a good mother, but that I am a good mother. He asks me if I'm dating anyone, which I innocently answer I am not. He even went so far to ask me if I was sexually active, which I rightfully declined to answer, although I'm not. He became really touchy with me, always wanting to touch my hair or hug me goodbye. He comments on my appearance a lot, telling me that I'm attractive and that I look in shape. He makes me stay later on certain days, even after he's home. I got the feeling those were the days that he had kicked his ex out, if she was even his ex. And last but not least, Jeremiah starts to advise me to come in through the garage and not the front door when I come in in the morning. Each time I do, I am greeted by a shirtless Jeremiah who attempts to go in for a lingering hug. I honestly think he wanted something to occur in that garage. He would attempt to keep me there conversing with him in the dark. It was a combination of those things, as well as what the kids tell me, that makes me question the legitimacy of everything he's ever told me. I begin to think that maybe Jeremiah didn't want a babysitter, but that maybe he really did want a new wife, and that he wanted me to be the mother of his kids. As time progresses, I really begin to dread going over there. I would begin to get anxiety even thinking about it. Nonetheless, I still continue to go, not telling a soul what's going on. As time progresses, I find out even worse news. Jeremiah's ex-wife wasn't his ex. They're still married. He apparently abuses her often and is paranoid that she is having an affair with someone, so he sent her away to Nigeria for a month. I learn all of this from the woman in the salon my aunt works at. Not only that, but also that Jeremiah constantly brings women home while the wife is away. She finds out about this because she sometimes pretends to go to work and stays behind to watch for visitors. She has asked him for a divorce, which is why he sent her away. I also learned that he would regularly threaten to kill her if she ever left him. By the time the truth has come out, I am done. I have about a month and some change left, but I tell Jeremiah I can no longer watch the kids because I have to attend basketball camp, which is a lie. 
He became visibly upset and literally told me that I have to continue to come back. I told him I would not be doing so, and that's when he started to become irate. He called me a slut, and he told me that the only reason that I wanted to leave him and the kids is because I was seeing other men. Mind you, I was 16 at the time with no obligation to watch over his kids or him. I left that day crying and I didn't come back the next day. My mom asked me why I wasn't working there and I told her because the job was too stressful. Well, about a week later, I'm up in my room and I hear the doorbell ring. I didn't think much of it until I heard Jeremiah's voice. I crept down to the living room to see him casually sprawled over one of our couches like he lives here. I hear his booming voice directed at my mother. In what I presume to be his authoritative voice, he states, we need to talk about my girl. She hasn't been to my house in a bit and the kids are starting to get worried. I don't like that. Where is she? My mother, picking up on the strangeness of the situation, lies to him and tells him that I have left with a friend. To which he has the audacity to ask whether it is a male or a female friend. Well, that is the straw that breaks the camel's back. My mom tells Jeremiah that his questions are invasive and predatory. She then asks him to leave, to which he does, to my utter surprise. From there on, I don't see or hear of Jeremiah for about a year. He still texts me, but I quickly learn to block his number. After a year, I learned some more information. His wife has gotten full custody of the kids and they're living in another city about an hour away from where we do. I thought that was miraculous because Jeremiah made it abundantly clear that those kids and the wife were his. A few months after learning that information, I'm on a jog in my neighborhood. When I wander by his house, I try to sprint past it, but I'm dead from my run. So instead I opt across the street and stay a good distance away in case he's nearby. I guess God was mad at me that day because out of nowhere, Jeremiah pulls into the road and stops his car near me. He rolls his window down and asks how I've been. I'm scared shitless, but he's pretty civil despite how we left things prior to this. He babbles about himself and makes some off comments about my body, but what catches my attention is what he says toward the end of our conversation. He tells me his wife has tricked him into losing custody of the kids, so this is how it occurs. She calls him while he is at work one day and tells him Jeremiah Jr. is acting up. Being the abusive piece of shit he is, he rushes home to show Jeremiah Jr. some discipline and respect, his words. Well, his wife records the whole thing. The police are called, a report is filed, and I guess that's how she's awarded temporary custody of the kids. However, he assures me that he will be getting his kids back because they are his, and that his wife will soon, and I quote, pay for her transgressions. The whole conversation makes me feel extremely uneasy, and I am glad when it ends. I run home and briefly tell my sisters about it, and then never think about it again. That is, until I hear the news a few weeks before my birthday from my aunt, of all people, that Jeremiah has gotten his kids back. His wife mysteriously fell ill, went back to Nigeria, and died. I know it sounds crazy. But that's exactly what my aunt told me. I am again frightened after hearing that news, and I disclosed to my sisters what he told me a few months prior to her death. About a year after that, I'm jogging again, and I pass his house, and this time he comes out of his home to wave me down. He asks me if I want to say hi to the kids, and I say no, they probably won't remember me. He then asks me something shocking. He asks if I want to say hi to his wife, and he calls her to come out. I'm then approached by a very young woman, probably a few years older than me, with a baby on her arm. She smiles and politely introduces herself. I am shook, so I exchange pleasantries and finish my jog. Once I get home, I tell my sisters what I've just witnessed. 
I don't know for sure that Jeremiah did anything to his wife, but I have an eerie feeling in my gut that he did. So for that I say to Jeremiah, let's never meet again. Welcome back, you guys made it. Those were some terrifying tales. Now, this is Future Raven. Past Raven did the intro, <laughs> Future Raven is doing the outro. So, my lovely computer could not handle the 4 hours and 40 minutes that this initially one video ended up being. So. This is the first two hours and 20 minutes of the video, and there will be a second uh, addition to this. So that probably is for the best since a nearly five hour premiere is a touch long. <laughs> um, so we'll just do back to back premieres. So this is the end of tonight's premiere, and we'll be back here tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, I think like 2 a.m. London time, uh, tomorrow for part two. Um, so normally I do one premiere a week if I do a premiere, um, but we're gonna have two, uh, on back-to-back -back days so that we can watch the entirety of this series or set of stories, um, without my computer dying. <laughs> so, Hopefully you guys enjoyed this rather lengthy video, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye. Ooh.